Good evening, and welcome to the fifth installment of Voices Amplified. My name is Jade Rogers. I'm your moderator for this evening. We are here at No More Empty Pots, and we're going to have a cooking demonstration, talk about food, health, and history. Before we get started, I'd like for everyone to introduce themselves. Hi, um, my name is Nancy Williams. I serve as the co-founder and CEO for No More Empty Pots. Good evening, I'm Mariah Henry. I also go by Chef Mariah B, and I am the production manager here at No More Empty Pots. Hello, my name is Mia Hill. I am the certificate coordinator uh, here at No More Empty Pots. Great, now what are we cooking? So today we have a Afro-vegan inspired menu. Uh, we're gonna be making a bowl, which is very popular right now, and we're gonna be uh, making red rice as our base. We have a mushroom and black eyed pea patty. We also can turn them into sliders that will go on top. And we have a stewed spinach, uh, most commonly known as Iforero in Africa, which is a traditional dish, but we remix it and made it into a side. And lastly, we'll be uh, roasting up some sweet potatoes with some black bean seasoning. Okay, so how did you come up with that menu based on this <laughs> conversation? <laughs> Uh, a little bit of research, um, and then I also draw a lot of inspirations from other chefs in the community. Um, of course, the vegan movement is very trendy and popular right now, but it's more than popular, it's a lifestyle. And I wanted to use something that drew back on our heritage, so that's where you have black eyed peas, um, and also using a lot of seasonal ingredients here in Nebraska, um, as well as local ingredients. So. Try to take what's local, what's seasonal, and then mix it into something that we could create, something that's very flavorful um, and very cultural, but also very sustenance for us. So you mentioned black eyed peas, and I have a <laughs> love, hate, and then love, hate, love relationship with black eyed peas. <laughs> um, what's your relationship with black eyed peas? Oh my goodness. My, my relationship with black eyed peas goes back to uh, being a kid growing up in Louisiana, where we grew most of the food that we ate, and uh, we had we grew black eyed peas, purple hull peas, and Crowder peas. Those are the main peas that that we grew, and so much so that um, we rarely bought any other food from the grocery store. We would buy like apples, flour, sugar, and occasionally when we had meat, uh, we would sometimes get like. Uh, a half uh, of a pig or a quarter of a cow or critters uh, like there I mean honestly I really grew up in a country so uh, we, sometimes there would be barbecue raccoon or hog moss oh. or squirrel or things like that but with peas that was the one thing that we didn't have to ask like where did this come from because you know what it is we planted it we uh, we hold the, the weeds out of it uh, we picked it we blanched it and put it in the freezer so we knew exactly and had a very intimate relationship with those peas but we were rarely sick we all know how to grow our own food and we pass that on to our kids so um, we have a, a high value for nutrition we have a strong work ethic in our family and we understand the value of land and food and community and one of the things that we used to do when we were kids was sit with our aunts and our grandmothers and do pea shelling. And that's when you hear oh the most fantastic stories that you get a chance to share with other people and you find out some family secrets that they, <laughs> couldn't, they wouldn't tell in the bigger family right. gathering, but you know, it's just one-on-one -on -one developing their relationship. So that's my relationship with peas. <laughs> <laughs> well, my, I'm from Omaha, but my father is from Arkansas. And he, the things that he would bring back from Arkansas, they had a special space in the refrigerator reserved just for those <laughs> things, like hog head cheese yes. mm -hmm. and all the black eyed peas. My mother is from also from Omaha, but her parents are originally from Arkansas as well. So wow. she would make the black eyed peas for him, mm -hmm. but did not consume them because she's a northerner. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's what she would say. But, you know, when he passed away about eight years ago, someone brought a huge thing of black eyed peas and shrimp mm. to the repast. Wow. Yes. And I'm like, you know, I have to eat everything that everybody brings so that I can say thank you yes. for bringing this dish. Yes. 
I don't like these things at all. So, well, I'll taste a little bit. And they were delicious. Mm -hmm. It blew my mind. Yeah. It was the fact that she was using like ham hocks. Uh -huh. And that created a smell that I didn't like and I didn't like the taste, yeah. but that shrimp. And then yeah. I realized that the black eyed peas will take on the flavor of anything yes, that you pair with it. So yes. now I have a love of black eyed peas. Yeah. Mariah, what else can you do with this, with this item that is from Africa? We brought it from Africa. What else can you do with it? Oh, um, just about anything. So today we're going to mash them up to make them into patties. Um, like I said, you can stew them, um, adding extra meats in there, soup is an also a big um, way that you can use beans, whether keeping them whole or also pureeing them as well. Um, and they're also very traditionally cooked uh, during New Year's time, especially um, for us. That's my introduction <laughs> with them, is that they were cooked every year for New Year's Eve. And I didn't like them until I made them myself. So. And why do you eat them in New Year's? Um, that's a good thing, because I never really paid attention to why. <laughs> <laughs> Mia, do you know why you eat them in New Year? Yes, it's part of the look of the New Year. You eat them for the for the look for the New Year. So, what yeah. is your relationship with with black eyed peas, and what else you eat at New Year's? Okay, so well, we have a good Southern smorgasbord. My grandmother is really into getting back to the. My grandmother is from uh, West Memphis, Arkansas. So, um, because yeah, yeah. because <laughs> my grandfather has had uh, 12, 13 siblings. And so um, they came from both from large families. And so when my grandmother and grandfather moved to Omaha, Nebraska, um, they brought their, the culture that they ate up. Mm -hmm. So when my grandmother would watch us, we ate beans. Yeah. If grandpa would come from the jitney stand, food was prepared for him and you mm -hmm. ate what he ate. And so black eyed peas, pinto beans, hog mugs, pig ears, we, those yeah. are the things he liked. Yes. So we had to like it in return. So what grandma did to make us like it, she put sugar in it. Um. I know that's kind of bad, but she put a little sugar on top of it to kind of get us to be like, oh, yeah, this is really good. Can I have some more, you know, uh -huh. type of thing. Um, so, yeah, that's, that's, I love them because of what it means to me. Like, my grandfather is no longer here, mm -hmm. so that's part of the culture, remembering who he was. Um, just be able to sit down and enjoy the yeah. smells and yeah. hearing him eat and smack, you know, those are <laughs> things that I remember when I eat those type of meals. Yeah. 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 So in New Year's, we also have greens. Mm -hmm. Um, So uh, greens, what's, what's your favorite kind of green? My favorite kind of green that I eat right now <laughs> is kale because it's versatile and it holds up in a lot of different uh, preparations. Uh, and lacinato kale in particular because it, it presents so well. I just sauteed some last night. And whether you're mixing it in a soup or whether you're garnish, using it as a garnish or you're serving with rice or potatoes, whatever, it, it has this deep green color and it uh, adds like this jewel tone of a palette to your plate. But growing up, it was the mix of mustards and turnips with the turnip bottoms in the greens because I never had, the only way that we ever had uh, greens without the mix was if one of the greens were not available at mm -hmm. the time. Mm -hmm. And it was rare that neither one of them were not available because unless it was really hot in the summer, then, because it gets really hot and they bolt really easily, and then we'd be switching uh, to more peas. That was the rotation mm -hmm. uh, with how the seasons ran. And we literally... You go out to the garden and you pick what was fresh, and that's what you ate that day. And if there was nothing that was ready in between or, no, or there were not enough kids available to go do the picking, you pull from what was in the freezer. And we rarely froze greens because they were always available. Mm -hmm. the, but the thing that I hated the most was washing them. <laughs> I, I hate, I won't use expletives, but I hated washing greens. And I remember specifically one time that I was given the task of washing the greens after somebody had picked them. And it had been three times. I'm like, that's enough. I got other <laughs> stuff to do. And so I went ahead and cooked them. And oh my God, at the bottom of that pot was grits and there were caterpillars and oh stuff. My God. But I was making all the plates so nobody ever saw what was in the bottom of the pot. 
And, I, and that was reinforcing that lesson to me of this is why you spend the extra time to wash the greens. Today, I know it's just a little more protein, a little more fiber, <laughs> a little silica. <laughs> However, at the time, you know, it's not cool to like have grit at the bottom of your green pot. <laughs> I've done that too. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> After three times, you get tired. Yes. <laughs> Although I love the feeling of the greens yes. between my hands and the salt and the just yes. exfoliates and all the other things. Yes. But, you know, you do get tired of that. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Favorite kind of greens? Um, right now I really like turnips and mustard greens. Um, I've been using a lot of Indian spices in my mustard greens, um, and those kind of cook down very quickly. Um, and they don't, they're not as hardy to toughen up. Uh, but growing up, I still love collard greens, the mix of mustard, collards, turnips, all mixed in there. You gotta put the neck bone in the ham hock. Mm -hmm. and now we do turkey necks and turkey, turkey stuff, turkey meat, smoked turkey, uh, it's just a little better for us, so. Mm -hmm. yeah. All three, the collards, yeah. mustard, turnips. My grandma's now started incorporating our gutter, hit the uh, Swiss chard. The mm -hmm. bottoms, mm -hmm. just good. for the color, the purple, yeah. the, the wild colors to add some more color to her green. So she's been doing that as well. So yeah, that's cool. Yeah. That's good. Well, we're really talking about a weed. Yes, we're talking about something that people. So, <laughs> yes. Uh, so a weed technically is any plant growing out of place that is yes. undesirable. Yes, but that's what enslaved people were picking to bolster the rest of their rations of cornmeal and meat stock or whatever they had yes that's what they were using to to get some nourishment because yes. we know that for the most part most enslaved people were malnourished yeah mm -hmm. so they were using what they whatever they could wherever they could to add to their diets and add to their day and give them the energy to do yes. the work that they were doing yeah uh, you can't have greens without cornbread Oh, you can, but it's you not can. as pleasant. <laughs> I thought it was a rule. <laughs> that's how I grew up. Why you got the greens? I don't have no cornbread. <laughs> it is a sad affair without the cornbread. Right. So all of these things mix and marry together. Um, and the history of all of these things. What is, what is your fondest memory of food. Oh, we don't have time for that. <laughs> uh, my fondest memory of food would just have to be an amalgam. I mean, literally, I started a whole freaking nonprofit because I like food. So <laughs> uh, there's nothing that uh, tops my love of food besides uh, my family and the people that I care about. It literally is that means that much to me because it it helps. To, it helps you decide who you are in the world, I think. And that's one reason why I want to make sure that people have access and opportunity to try as much as possible. Because many people think they don't like things, but it's just because they haven't been exposed mm -hmm. to it in a way that meets them where they are. And then once they have that opportunity, it opens up a whole other world of possibility that goes beyond just that gastro, the, the, the gastro engagement mm -hmm. of it. Um, gro probably growing our own food and sitting around with uh, family during mealtime. During the week, we mostly ate like peas and rice and cornbread and greens and sweet potatoes. Um, there was some combination of those things because like I said, we grew most of the food we ate. I'm the oldest of six kids. Uh, my parents worked. My mother didn't make $20,000 until she graduated from college mm -hmm. at 57 and started working as a social worker. Mm -hmm. And I was like, damn, mama, all this time, all that overtime, and she would make like $12,000 a year? Mm -hmm. so it still makes me emotional about that. Um, but, but food is that one constant. We never went hungry. There were always people at our house to eat for all the things we had, we were we, I, I have my early memory of being a bully around a kid in the neighborhood <laughs> coming to eat and we coined a song that we would sing to him when he showed up because we got tired of him coming over to eat. <laughs> and when my mother found out, there was a little hell to pay and we had to stop doing that. 
But it's been that, that great thing that helped us, um, helped us figure out um, what our work ethic is, how we move in the world, what it means to be loved by somebody, mm -hmm. and what it means to be self-sufficient and be able to, to own your own path. That, that's what food means. Need to pop that note. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> um, some of my fondest memories, I think it was um, just learning from others and passing down um, the knowledge. Uh, I remember my great aunt, which is why I got involved in agriculture. She used to always keep a garden and um, have a community garden plot as well. And she would always have us out there. And I never really understood the connection. And she was always saying, it's better when it's fresh and the zucchini bread. And she'd make these delicious zucchini fries and the first time that I was able to pick a strawberry out and eat it straight from the the garden uh, pretty changed like changed my life the whole entire time and that's when I had a real connection with just life itself and the energy from the soil going all the way back to our ancestors and the slaves and how it's like passed down and now that I'm able to kind of combine all of the skills and put it together in a way that um, can help serve our community in a way that maybe it didn't before um, and just being able to like break bread and, and fellowship is huge because I think that's what food is to us is being able to come together and we may not have a lot of other things but here at this table mm -hmm. with the food that we prepare we have everything we needed absolutely yeah. Yeah. that's awesome I don't even know if I can go behind either one of you <laughs> I mean uh, <laughs> um to me honestly food is like an act of love um I feel like if anybody can go to McDonald's and Burger King pick up burger but when somebody actually sits down or stands up and you know takes the time to put incorporate all these ingredients together and they're playing their favorite music and they're you know you you feel the love when you take that bite you know you know that they took some time to cook that food for you and so for me that that's always a great experience when my friends and my parents and my grandmothers and my grandma they sit down and they're like oh my god this food is so good you know there's no better feeling than to to know that you took the time to, to for them to enjoy something that you prepared, and so yeah, that that's that's how I feel about food. I I feel the same way. Yeah. Um, some of my earliest memories, my grandparents were born in my mother's parents were my babysitters, mm -hmm. and they were born in 1900. My grandfather and my grandma was born in 1901, mm -hmm. so. <laughs> 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 You know, I'm sitting at the feet yes. <laughs> of people, and when it when it hit me as as I'm in college, reading these stories about you know our people that I yes. didn't learn in school, yes. and I'm thinking I was at the feet of people who knew their ancestors who were enslaved. Yes, mm -hmm. and I always think about my grandfather. He had a garden. He had a garden in the 30s mm -hmm. during the Depression. I used to ask my mother about. You know, oh my God, how was it? Were you starving? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I read about this in school right. today. And she was like, what are you talking exactly. about? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> we were always poor. Right. We always had food. Exactly. I was like, but that's not what the book said. Right. But that was not her reality because yes. they had a garden and they had a community that looked out for each other. Yes. So I always think about when I was with my grandparents, my grandfather, he would have me in the garden until I saw that snake. <laughs> <laughs> and then I was just on the porch. Yes, yes. <laughs> but um, he would take tomatoes and he would take a bite out of a tomato. Yes. Mm -hmm. He'd be like, no, nope, it's not ready. And he would throw it in, in a yard uh -huh. in a vacant lot across the street that started to grow tomatoes. Yes. <laughs> and he did that. And my grandmother would have me on the porch shelling peas. and snapping beans yes. and all of these other things and, yeah. and all of the greens and preparing all of these things. So at a very young age, I understood that your food is right there. Yes. Mm -hmm. And it, the, the act of preparing it for your family mm -hmm. is an act of love. Yes. So we've talked about all of these other components. The basis of this meal is rice. Yes. So why rice? Um, one, it's easy to prepare, but it, it's really traditional rice and peas, rice and beans um, throughout a lot of the cultures, um, from Africa even to the Jamaican to the Caribbean. Um, 
and it's well uh, easily to season. And so we can add a bunch of different spices to it. Um, and so we have um, gluten-free soy sauce that we put in there. So it's tamari. And um, we also spice that up with an African spice as coriander and paprika and cinnamon. Um, and we really wanted to take on the flavors um, that were close to home for us. And we enter, we put it into that rice. Um, and sometimes, right, you can get a good, good batch of rice. You get a bad batch of rice. <laughs> um, and so this one, I think, is pretty foolproof, um, just to really bring out a lot of flavors. And it's it's hearty. It it has carbs in it, so it's going to give us um, some energy to sustain us through the workday. And that's yeah. what a lot of um, our culture used to eat. We yeah. still do. So anybody have any family that is from the South Carolina region? No. I don't either. But based on our African DNA test, <laughs> <laughs> my mother's family is from Sierra Leone. What? Wow. wow. Right. So Sierra Leone is where African people were taken and taken together mm -hmm. and dropped on the coast, the Sea Island coast of South Carolina and Georgia. Mm -hmm for the purpose of producing rice. Mm -hmm. They kept them together because they knew how to produce rice. Yeah. And it's not an easy thing to produce, just like sugar. Uh -huh. But um, in doing that, they were isolated. Yeah. They were able to maintain their culture, yeah. maintain their language yeah. in a way that no one else in the United States mm -hmm. was able to do, and much yeah. of the Caribbean was able to do. So the fact that you have rice in this dish is um, going to go into some other things that we talk about with the Gullah people in next month's yeah. Voices Amplified. Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> um, are we ready to cook? I think we are. Mm -hmm. Are yes. we ready to cook? All okay. right. So what is the first thing that we need to do? Right, so she's going to be working on our spiced black bean patties, and I'll be prepping the sweet potatoes and uh, the spinach. And so right now we have most of our ingredients prepped out, and I just have a few things to prep out. I'm going to show you guys how to um, go ahead and cut into your onion, um, and also how to go ahead and slice um, the red peppers and the sweet potatoes for your dish. So I will start here. Um, these onions are also local. The sweet potatoes as well um, from Grand Brew Farms. So here at the Empty Pots, we cook a lot of meals, and it's a wonderful thing that we can support farmers, especially during the pandemic, and um, keep everything that we have in house locally grown. So just going to go ahead and peel this off, and if you are following along with the recipe, this is for the spinach, and we are just going to use half of the spinach and slice this up. And while she's doing that, I'm going to go ahead and start my uh, the black bean patty. So uh, I have my oil in the pan, and it's warming up, ready to go, or will be ready to go here in a second. And I'll incorporate my onions and my garlic here soon. Perfect. And then here you'll also get, and here you'll also have um, a pureed mixture. This has red peppers, habanero, or you also can use scotch bonnet, um, and it also has half of a red onion. And so traditionally when you make the dish, um, they use a lot of different red peppers that are very spicy, um, that are mild, also very hot. Just kind of use it to your level um, of spiciness that you like. And they would cook this puree down and then also add in fresh onions and fresh peppers. But also this dish also has a lot of meat. So a lot of goat, they use meat, tripe, um, a lot of different bones. And you just kind of cook it down and stew it. And traditionally, of course, they wouldn't use the spinach that we have here in the States. Um, sometimes it's a mixture of cowpea, the amaranth leaf, mm -hmm. and also spider flower. And those are a lot of different spinaches and they cook down um, quite differently. And so here, I'm just gonna pull some of these stems off. I traditionally like to keep the stem on because there's a lot of nutrients in here. Um, we will go ahead and take some of these down. So you said nutrients. So what are the health benefits of, well, we'll just talk about the black eyed peas. Uh, so those have 
a lot of energy, but maybe Nancy, do you yeah. want to talk about the black eyed uh, peas? Black eyed peas have calcium, lots of fiber. Uh, fiber you get vitamin E. There's a really good source of protein. A lot of plant-based um, uh, meat alternatives these days use uh, some form of pea protein. It's usually chickpeas. Uh, one, because it's, that's something that uh, has a lot of mass to it. But in the same way that you can use chickpeas, you can also use black eyed peas. Um, they aren't as meaty, and they have a softer texture, and they take on, uh, they can hold more water usually than the chickpeas do. Uh, so it's, it's um, a more malleable protein, and it's mild. It will take on whatever flavors are there. Uh, but the primary things are fiber, calcium, and protein that you get from black eyed peas with some vitamin E, folic acid, some B vitamins. Thanks, Nancy. You're welcome. You, <laughs> <laughs> These are the you things that I tell there. people unsolicited yeah. when they ask one question. <laughs> <laughs> so, Mariah, what is your background? So my background, well, it's a combination of a lot of different things, um, but I studied agricultural sciences when I went to Florida A&M uh, in Tallahassee, Florida, and I was a agricultural student and I originally wanted to be a dentist, and so I was a biology student, but the same requirements were um, to get into dental school, but also to be an agricultural major. So going all the way up to organic chemistry um, and taking all of those classes, I seen that I could kind of knock two, two birds out with one stone. Um, and that quickly changed after I did my first internship in South Africa, because um, going into the agriculture program, there were a lot of grants that weren't being used by students just because the major wasn't that popular. Mm -hmm. And um, I found a home there. I got to see a vision of myself all over the world, but more particularly um, in women in Africa who were running businesses and they owned land and they had farms and they were helping their community in a way that I wanted to. And I changed my major, I never looked back. I went abroad almost every year after that. So I extended my college uh, duration a little bit, but it was well worth it. And a big part of my food journey changed when I was in Europe. I studied abroad in Vienna, Austria for almost half a year. And just seeing how they were eating in their lifestyles, their fridges are almost our dorm size fridge. And when you go to travel, you only can um, kind of carry what you can walk with. You know, I didn't have a car, I was on public transportation. So I started buying week to week and just only buying what I needed at the time. And that really changed my entire food journey um, when I came back to the States, so. And where are you from originally? I am from Indianapolis, Indiana. I was born in Colorado Springs. Um, and then I also moved around quite a bit um, later in high school. And after I finished school in Tallahassee, I worked a little bit in the industry. I also worked here. And then I was inspired so much that I went and got my culinary degree in uh, Charlotte, North Carolina at Johnson & Wales University. Nice. So one question, and then I'm going to go back to Nancy. So did you see, did you know about agriculture as a major? Was that on your radar? You know what, it wasn't. Um, and if I did, I thought of it as, um, either it was like in the government or you're just strictly like in the science field of it. And people would normally come and joke around and say, so you're getting a degree to be a farmer? Because that's what people um, thought about agriculture degrees was just for farming purposes. And when I got into it, it opened up a whole new world for me. Um, I did research at a vineyard um, in Tallahassee that a lot of students didn't know that we also had. Um, and also I say all all roads lead to ag because, because they do, from our clothing to our food to our history. Um, it's more than just what we can put on a plate. Um, it's essential in our everyday lives. And, I asked yeah. that question because um, I, I saw this woman when I moved back to Omaha in about 2008, and she was speaking before a crowd of people, and she said that her degrees were in agriculture. And I saw this black woman up there, <laughs> and I said, <laughs> Who is she? <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, I want to be like her. <laughs> and I really thought if I had really known about agriculture as, a, as an option, I really feel like that's what I would have gone into um, because of my family history and because of my relationship with 
the earth. <laughs> and all of my family has been farmers. So, I, but I never saw myself, I never saw that as a, as a road for myself. So the woman was Nancy. <laughs> I was just like, who is this woman? I have to know her. I know her. Yes, you know her. So Mia, mm -hmm. how do you come to No More Empty Pots? So um, I actually came in as a student for No okay. More Empty Pots. Uh, I was in a program called uh, Culinary uh, Workforce. PWTP. Um, so basically, I actually quit my job at um, working at First Data for about four or five years, and it just was a job. And so I was not uh, living my purpose. Mm -hmm. And so I talked to my mate, and I was like, I gotta live my purpose. I will not die on this earth and not be able to do what I love. And so no more empty pots came around. I took that step of leap of faith and I quit my job. Um, surprising enough, nothing went turned off. Nothing. We, we, we were, everything was all good. Everything kept going. Um, and then we got the blessing. I still was able to pay bill. You know, it just was a blessing. So I feel like this was a great path for me to start as a student. And then I went to Metro and started my culinary classes. And even still, um, I'm still taking classes at Metro. But I also got a promotion here teaching, doing what I, you know, I was a student. Now I'm teaching my, the students how to cook, which is a really, that's a big blessing, like to be able to, to show them what I learned. And so I think for me, that's important to me. That's what I've learned from No Empty Pots. You know, you always got to keep teaching your community how to do it, but, you know, reach them however you can, Re reach them where they are, you know and be able to teach them, you know, there's different things, there's a different way to eat, there's, there's different processes to, to learn stuff. I love the fact that we have, you know, Chef Mariah and also other chefs here, and we all learn from each other. There's just not one way in cooking things. There's multiple ways of cooking things, and I love that about food. Hmm. And good. there's, the food is inherently healthy. Yeah. There's yes. nothing unhealthy about what we would consider soul food, which I say yeah. that there's a few different soul foods in the United States. Yes, Lord. You know. <laughs> there is no one soul food. No, yes. it is not. Yes. <laughs> so where are we at in our preparation now? So, yep, so I just cut on the pan. We're just, my method is heat the pan, heat the fat, anytime you want to sear or saute. Um, I have the spinach that's chopped up, and you're talking about it being healthy. Um, I know that a lot of our vegetables, our green vegetables, get a lot of the forefront, but um, eating the rainbow, as we all like to say, mm -hmm. um, eating from our orange vegetables, our red, our greens, our purples, all of them have these beautiful chemicals in them that provide nutrients um, and benefits to the body. And of course, spinach um, provides for great digestion. It's great in iron. It's a great source of vitamin A. And right now what I'm going to do is saute some, sorry, I'm actually going to put this puree in here. And we're going to let that kind of cook off just a little bit. And that's where we are in the process. And so you can use a spatula or just mix it around. But again, this has the scotch bonnet or the habanero pepper, um, the red onion, and also a red pepper. That's pureed here with a little tomato paste. So is it going to be hot, hot? It's not going to be that spicy. We only used about a quarter of the habanero. so. It's about this, okay. about this it's much so here. Just keep it in mind. It's going to be hot. <laughs> <laughs> just a little, just a little, little, little tang. Um, and so we're going to let that cook for a little bit, and then I'll go ahead and add the onions. I think onions and garlic are just a great base to any foundation of yes, a dish. Absolutely. You can never go wrong with it. Um, and I actually grew garlic, I think, for the first time when I was last here in Omaha a couple Yay. years ago. Um, I worked with a elementary school um, helping to kind of keep their community garden alive. So that was interesting and exciting all in itself. Um, and now I'm going to go ahead and add in the onions here. I'm going to go ahead and just mix and incorporate all of this in. And I'm gonna also going to add the red pepper. So Let's while she's doing that, I'm actually, uh, I took a half a cup of uh, black eyed peas out of here. And I put it in a bowl, and I'm currently mashing uh, the black-eyed peas up. 
to prepare them. In my pan, I have my mushrooms, my garlic, my onions, the Brer Rare seasoning. Um, so I'm just waiting for that to cool down a little bit. So after I mash it, I can incorporate, incorporate all of that together to make the patty. So the seasoning that you, you've mentioned, Brer Brea 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 Brea, 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 mm-hmm. Brea, Brea, so what is that? So it's an African seasoning. It has coriander, cumin, yeah, cinnamon, uh-huh. um, paprika, yeah. um, mm-hmm. salt oh. in there. I think, am I missing anything? Cardamom. Sorry, cardamom. Yes. yes. <laughs> and that's it. Awesome. A lot of the seasonings that you happen to come across, African seasonings, they're actually, you know, Afri- Africa period seasonings. You'll come across a lot of paprikas. You'll come across a lot of cardamom. You'll come across a lot of coriander, Mm -hmm. Um, cinnamon. I would have never thought to use cinnamon outside of, you know, making a little quick cinnamon toast, you know. (laughs) 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 You know, or put it in your sweet potato pie, you know. But to actually use it as a a flavor enhancer in your meals, that's really awesome. It's awesome. I have, um, let me pull out my list of of foods that come from the continent. So we have <laughs> <laughs> um, okra, watermelon, mm-hmm. black-eyed peas, yams, millet, sorghum, coffee, palm oil, cola mm-hmm. nut, tamarind, hibiscus, and rice. And I have that there are two different types of rice, mm-hmm. only two, mm-hmm. and everything else is a variation yeah. of those two. There's an Asian and there's an African. Mm-hmm. Okay. That's my list. Yes. Um, it's interesting you bring up um, palm oil. Yes. Um, so traditionally, you would we're using olive oil for our dish here, but um, in Africa they use a lot of peanut oils as well, and the palm kernel oil is also very popular there. We also know that it's used in a lot of our products here in the United States, um, and a lot of companies and producers are trying to minimize that and use a more sustainable oil. Um, just because of the way that it's harvested, it's not really good for our environment. And mm-hmm. so that's something that's traditional there. We don't really cook with it that much. Um, but something that I did pick up just from culinary school and just studying is that they infuse their oils a lot. So um, making it a little spicy or even making it into a butter as mm-hmm. well, using a butter and adding some of the hot peppers that you want adds a lot of flavor into your cooking. So it minimizes mm-hmm. all of those different spices that you need. Um, and to me, kind of when you put a lot of different combination of flavors, the cardamom, um, the cinnamon, or the paprika, you really don't miss that salt in there. And sometimes I just use a little salt just to balance it out versus to add a saltiness um, to the food. And so this is a really quick, simple dish. Um, now I'm just going to add the spinach in here. We're going to mix that up. It's going to give us a really bright green and red color. It's going to look really nice in our bowl. And you can give this a rough chop however you want to um, cook the spinach. You don't need to add any extra liquids or waters. And we're just going to cook this down until it's softened. And this will be done. We'll go ahead and set this aside. It smells delicious. (laughs) Yes. We also are going to add our seasoning in there in just a second. And that will be the final step of our Ifo Rero Regan. So in my mixture, I've uh, just incorporated the mushroom mixture and also the sweet potato mixture. And I added some cilantro to it as well. And I'm about to add a little bit of the scotch bonnet to mine as well. <laughs> it's not that spicy, man. It's promise. not that spicy. <laughs> it's not, it's gonna be just fine. Okay. <laughs> you also yeah. can use jalapenos in that recipe as well. Um, but I'm a fan of scotch bonnet peppers. Um, so do you have to do any special handling of scotch bonnet? Like, are there precautions you should take if you're handling scotch bonnets? I would wear gloves. Okay. Any pepper that you use. Yeah. I would wear gloves. Wash your knife immediately after. Wash your board. Wash your table. I mean, I've, your I've literally, yeah, your hands, yeah. everything. Don't touch your face. Don't touch your face. <laughs> yes. It's painful reminder. It's painful, yes. Very much so. Okay. <laughs> <Thank you>. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and you can leave the seeds in there uh-huh. or de seed them. Um, a lot of like curries and um, the Jamaican culture, they'll take the entire um, mm-hmm. pepper and then just kind of put it into the pot. Mm-hmm. You kind of let it expand a little bit and then you can take it out 
it's also where you can control that heat a little bit. Uh huh. Um, of course, we minced ours up really nice and fine, so yes. you're not gonna get a big hot. <laughs> You love to like this pepper. Fair. That's oh, awesome. Okay. <laughs> I remember a chili cook off uh, for United Way one year, and um, someone they said they used hot peppers and they said they used habanero, but they failed to say how many habanero, mm. and so the judges could not fill their lips oh, wow. after they finished testing that chili, and then learned that she put five. Habaneros in that little pot of chili. She was not invited to uh, <laughs> compete wow. the next year. <laughs> that was a mess. Wow, no. <laughs> but this does smell awesome. I definitely say experiment with your heat levels. Um, and they're really easy to grow as well. So um, something that's nice to grow in the summer. And so now we are going to move over to our sweet potato. These are also local from Grandview Farms. And I'm just going to cut the ends off. We're just going to cut them into about a quarter to a half an inch um, round. And I also keep the uh, skin on the sweet potatoes. Um, these are a great source of vitamin A as well. Um, I could have what? I could have saved all that time, girl. Eat the yeah. whole thing, wash it on Yes. <laughs> yes. And one thing I, I don't, I hate peeling things. So I will often roast or bake. I usually bake sweet potatoes. Uh, I will wash them, cover the skin in some sort of oil, mm -hmm. uh, and then bake them. And if you need it to be peeled, like if you're making sweet potato pies or something like that, the skin just slips right off. You don't have to spend all those hours. Plus, you're taking away the nutrients when you peel it. Mm -hmm. And one thing that I think a lot of people may not realize is, the reason there's a bunch of nutrients right between that layer of skin and the actual vegetable is because that's where the, the healing property of the potato is. If you ever notice that when it's, and it's nicked or scratched, it like starts to scab and heal over. Mm -hmm. That's because that's part of his defense mechanism to, yes, to, to stay whole and survive. <laughs> and so, <laughs> That's why you don't want to peel all that off because you're taking away some of the nutritional impact and benefit of it. Potatoes yeah. heal themselves? Oh, pla A many plants do. Yeah. And ever yeah. you see plants that have been scratched and there's, you see that the skin changes color a little bit? Yeah, just like that. Um, right there, that's just like our skin starts to heal and scab over. Plants do the same thing. It's trying to keep the moisture from going out so it doesn't shrivel up. And that, that's part of its process of surviving. That's a good point because I think um, when a lot of people shop, they tend to go for that perfect kind of porcelain one mm -hmm. and just understanding like there's nothing wrong with this, there's nothing bad. I tend to kind of look for the stuff with the bruises because uh, I know it's probably not going to get picked up. And here in our um, American market, it's a lot of we eat and we buy with our eyes versus um, what it looks like. and um, that's something that I try to now re-educate and encourage others um, to think about the processes and the energy it takes just to make this sweet potato and how you want to pick it up because there's a dent or there's a bruise and bananas are another great thing. I work mm -hmm. with Chiquitas, so I have a little <laughs> special place for bananas and, and how people shop and eat with, with that, but just some consumer insights of how we shop, um, going for the fresh and outside of the, the grocery store then versus going inside where the processed foods and right and all of those things are. So um, just very quickly to hop back in here, I just sliced um, the sweet potatoes and I'm just gonna drizzle a little bit of the oil and we're gonna toss that. And then here we're also gonna toss the blackening season which already has salt. So you do not need to add extra salt. If you do, you will see the difference in that. So um, just be cautious of it. And you can add as much or as little as you would like. I like to thoroughly coat mine and then we also have the oven preheated at about 375 to 400 degrees. And you're going to go ahead and bake them for about 15 to 20 minutes until they're soft. You want to go ahead and flip them over about halfway. So what's the difference between a sweet potato and a yam? Ooh. It's mainly in this country. Um, mm. It's the language that, that we are accustomed to. Um, 
some people will talk about yams if they grew up calling them yams. I grew up calling them sweet potatoes. The biggest difference in the store and in the diaspora is that uh, yams are a tuber that usually have more starch and less sugar, and you'll see that they'll be lighter in color. Uh, we also have uh, purple uh, sweet potatoes here, uh, but they're all from the same family. It's the starch content and sugar content that makes the difference. It blow my mind all the time. I had a, I studied a long time. I was in 4-H <laughs> FFA, uh, went to school and studied horticulture, uh, and then went to graduate school and studied plant pathology and weed science. And I, I love food. And my mother uh, is, is um, like the dad in the Big Fat Greek Wedding who believed that Windex <laughs> could cure everything. But she's like that about nutrition. So if you are sick, it's because you ain't eating the right stuff. Mm -hmm. So if you, if you fix your diet, you're going to fix your body. And so we grew up learning about all the nutrients and all the food all the time. Mm -hmm. And um, sweet potatoes are also good for those with diabetes. Mm -hmm. um, it is in a low to high glycemic index, and it will release some of the sugars into the bloodstream at a slower pace. Um, and it also contains a lot of magnesium, which is also um, known to kind of be correlated with stress levels. And so eat some sweet potatoes if you're feeling, feeling a little down, but if you want to regulate some things. And we also talk a lot about nutrition, but also our mental health and how it ties into our food. Um, and just the connection of it is interesting to me, and that's the part that I really like to dive into and explore, um, just how our, our mind and our body and our soul all connect. And it's a holistic approach from what's on the outside that comes into the inside. And so if we eat living things and put it into our living bodies, it's going to continue to live and to grow. Um, and just even in our community with mental health and kind of how it's not talked about, but then also seeing how it's directly correlated to our food and how some of our cities and our communities are based and set up that um, there's not a lot of access to fresh local foods. Um, but also just the missing educational piece of the correlation um, of why it's important to eat your sweet potatoes and why you should roast them, say, versus frying them. Um, and the myth that just vegan food is all completely healthy, but also that all soul food or, or black food is bad. Um, mm -hmm. So we have to kind of change that understanding um, for all cultures included. So what is a vegan? A vegan is someone that only eats plant-based so they don't eat any animal product um, and if you're really particular honey is included in there as mm -hmm. well so some people will eat honey and some people won't so you don't eat anything um, that is produced from an animal or that can reproduce mm -hmm. so it'd be your plants and your vegetables um, nutritional yeast is also a big thing in the vegan yeah. community because you can get um, a lot of nutrients from nutritional yeast but no eggs no meats no dairies and that's why now we have our plant butters and um, people are using a lot of the oils now. It's very similar to a Mediterranean diet, mm -hmm. um, which is very popular and very great um, just from using some of the healthy fats and also eating um, a well balance of fruits and vegetables, whole foods, grains, and also the oils as well. So I patty my uh, mixture up, my black IP mixture up and made little patty and just cooking those off for just kind of a brief moment. Um, and yeah, just waiting basically to kind of put everything else together with Chef Mariah. Yep. So we're going to get ready to assemble our bowl together. And there's a couple of different ways that you can do that. You can have the red rice as a base, or you can kind of make a platter, um, like a vegetarian platter, with kind of each section aligned wherever you would like it. We'll just go ahead and wait for the patties to come out. And so for those sweet potatoes, you would normally uh, just stick those in the oven and they would be cooking off while you are uh, finishing up this process? Correct. That would probably be one of the first things that I did was to go ahead and throw the sweet potatoes in the oven, um, get them out of the way while you prep um, for the patties. And the spinach would be the very last thing that I would make because it's very quick and it also retain its heat. And the patties have black eyed peas and mushrooms. Yes, they have local oyster mushrooms. You can also use a portobello, um, mm -hmm. but 
mushrooms have great umami flavor. So for people who are vegan, but they still kind of want that meaty flavor, meaty flavor yeah. that's where you're going to get them from, also from your tomatoes as well. Yeah. I'm going to need some of those for those. <laughs> out of the way. And we already have our pre-cooked rice. I had to put my gloves on. I made um, chickpea fritters oh, yesterday. Yeah. How were those? They were delicious. What did now, you put in them? Um, I put some seasoning and I think I just put seasoning. I don't think and I put anything peas? else okay. in it. Did you have like a sauce to go with it? There was a sour cream, but I just ate it. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> but the key, the key was my mother's 89, and so she's grown up eating a certain way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I didn't tell her what that what it was. Mm -hmm. And because it looked like meat, ah, she grabbed it and she ate it and she continued to eat it. And then somewhere... <laughs> In the evening, she was eating it with, you know, her salads and whatever. And she said, what is this meat? <laughs> <laughs> what is this meat you made? It's like, just eat it. It's good, right? It is good. It's flavorful. It's good. <laughs> just keep eating it. Never did tell her. It's yes. chickpeas. That's the key. I think um, you don't, don't tell them before or they'll mm -hmm. get really picky. Right. And, and they don't want to eat it afterwards. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm just going to go ahead and take a little bit of our red rice base. So you will already have this pre-cooked. This has green peppers, onions, garlic in it as well. And it is mixed with um, the bear bear spice. And then we also tossed in some green onions as well. And this is really where you can get creative and make it however you like. If you want more of one thing or not, I'm just going to add a little of our spinach here. peppers in there. I added shallot, garlic, and mixed in a tempura batter. Yeah, that's why yeah. she liked it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's not just naked chickpeas, salt, and pepper. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> All right. So I've kind of made mine with a The rice as a base. Oh, that's hearty. Yes. That and is, you're going to be full after this. This is a shareable one. <laughs> I'm going to do a little plate right here. And so you can add sauces on top of this if you'd like. Um, a popular one would maybe be a tahini sauce, which is um, pureed sesame seeds. And that's also very popular in the Mediterranean diet, but you also find that in hummus as well. So if you can't stand tahini, what else would you use? Um, <laughs> if you like avocado, you can yes. make an avocado cilantro yes. um, base. Okay. If you are open to using nuts, you can make a cashew cream sauce, Okay. Um, which doesn't really require any um, heat. You just want to soak your um, cashews in water, and then you grind it up and it purees into something really, really fine and very smooth. Mm -hmm. um, you can also make a lot of vegan sour creams out of cashew cream, mm -hmm. or people use it in pasta sauces. Um, so the thing about the vegan movement, as I, I, I call it, um, it's very innovative. Mm -hmm. People are finding new ways to enjoy all the things we've already had in a new way, and it's not the bird food or it's not just the salad, um, but playing with what you have in there, and you never know what you can create and you can find. Um, drawing some inspiration if you wanted an Asian flavor and you wanted to use a soy sauce oh, base. Yeah. Um, or an Indian flavor and, and spices mm -hmm. and curries and powders. Mm -hmm. So you can really make this type of bowl into any flavor profile that you'd like. Mm -hmm. To add any type of nutrients or ingredients, you can pop some tomatoes on there, um, garnish it with more cilantro or parsley. Uh, it's really whatever you fancy, but this is pretty spiced and has a lot of good flavor, not too spicy. And um, <laughs> this is your red rice bowl. That is, I want to like clap because I know. Just so, I think you should just clap. It's just, just it clap. looks so good. It smells so good, and I'm getting like uh, Jimmy Dean sausage 
patty vibes from right. these. Right. Um, because I can't eat that stuff anymore. Um, meat actually makes me inflamed, and so I can't mm -hmm. eat as much meat. Uh, I, there's one kind of bacon I can eat, and so I eat that, and the other stuff, I just, it, it really does upset my body. And so it's that flavor combination I'm looking for. So if I were to take that and I would put in like sage and those kind of spices that you normally find in like pan sausage, mm -hmm. I think that this could be like an inspiration for that. Oh, absolutely, yeah. yeah. That's, That's awesome. actually sounds good, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <like, laughs> oh. <laughs> got me thinking there. Yeah. Yeah. This is amazing. That is amazing. You want to hold it up higher mm -hmm. so for a view? Look at that. All right. So any tips for people with their boxes or their um, kits? You know, there's no wrong way to do this. If you wanted to cube your potatoes instead of put them in rounds, um, there isn't really any way. You just want to watch the heat of your... Um, pan mm -hmm. in your oil so you don't burn anything. We do mince a lot of the onions and garlic. Mm -hmm. I would say onions down first, garlic next so you don't get that burnt. Yeah. Um, and then also taste your mixture. Again, yes. all of this is already... Since you're um, at home, you're a yeah. at home chef, you got to taste your food. That's important. I tell my students that all the time. Taste your food as you go. Then you'll know the process as far as what it tastes like when it's raw versus when it's cooked. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. Yep. Great. Anything else? Just um, that we're done. Yeah, I think that's it. We I think that's it. I think yeah. the bowl is done. Thank you all so yeah, much. This has been a pleasure. Getting to know you and talking about food and history, and uh, we're gonna taste that now, right? Because <laughs> <laughs> okay. everybody at home has got their bowl, <laughs> and they're gonna stop watching this and they're gonna eat it. <laughs> yes. So I think that that's what you know. I'd like to eat. <laughs> <laughs> yes, well, you're the only one with the face shield, so I think that you get the you get a spoon and you can check it out. Okay, um, all right. So you can go ahead and and I'll do that. Yes. All right. So thank you, Omaha Performing Arts viewers, for jo I know, but I gotta look first. <laughs> you're giving me all the direction. I gotta read the words. Okay. Okay. So thank you to No More Empty Pots and Omaha Performing Arts. Uh, next, on February 4th, we have Ranky Tanky and talking about history and Gullah culture. And thank you so much. Have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you. That was awesome.